we've really had a problem with this. And so instead of a Merry Christmas, it's been a scary Christmas to some extent. But I want you to know something. The Bible says, don't be afraid. And there's a lot of people running around extremely afraid of everything. Now, my old professor, Dr. Malcolm McDowell, he did come down with COVID and had a bad case of it. The doctor said he would not leave the hospital alive. And, well, I talked to him yesterday, and he was going home. Actually, he got home yesterday. I talked to him on Christmas Eve. He says, so it is real, but if you run around scared, that's unhealthy as well. It may be worse unhealthy. Amen. So in the Christmas story, we have four, people told, four groups of people told, don't be afraid. The first person told to not be afraid is to marry. So that was by herself, and then Joseph by himself. But then we have the shepherds. So this whole gang of them get told, not, don't be afraid. And then Zachariah, another individual, don't be afraid. So there's a lot of, at Christmas time, don't be afraid. So I'm saying, don't be afraid. Walk around like scared people. You need to walk around confident people, children of God, knowing God's going to help you through whatever you face. So what fears that people face at Christmas? The first one. Mary faced the fear of inadequacy. Inadequacy. She felt extremely inadequate. You say, well, how's that? Well, it all begins with an angel appears to a poor peasant girl in Nazareth on the backside of nowhere of the Roman Empire. No education, poor. And she's being told by an angel that the promised Messiah for thousands of years is going to be born as a baby, and she's going to be the mother. Well, I don't know about you, but that would be inadequate to anybody getting that message. And second, there's a problem. She's a virgin. So there's a problem there because she's a virgin and she's going to have a baby. And third is she's engaged to a guy named Joseph. Now, how is she going to explain to her fiancé, Joseph, that she's already going to have a baby and they haven't been together yet? Fourth, she's told, of course, this is the promised Messiah for all people. Not just her nation, but for all people. And she gets to raise, what, the perfect child. You know, the, you know you, normally you get a child and the guy imperfections make you feel good. I'm imperfect, my baby's imperfect, so what's the difference? You know, we're all imperfect. But you got to raise the perfect child, and he is God, so you better be good because he's going to remember everything you do to him, right? When you spank him and he didn't deserve being spanked, okay? Yeah. When you put him in timeout and you should have been timeout. I've seen parents like that, especially at restaurants. Parents are messing up, they're blaming it on the kids. No, they are the problem. You don't give kids red Kool-Aid, okay? It just fires them up. That's why at vacation Bible school you don't have red Kool-Aid, okay? Just remember that, right? Now, another thing is how are you going to explain it to your father, your mother, and your friends? Hmm, we're really... You know, you tell mom and dad, hey, I'm going to have a baby, but I haven't been with a man. They go, yeah, right. I don't think so. Then you tell your fiancé, and he's not buying it either. And then he gets a notice from the Roman government that he's got to go back to his hometown of Bethlehem for the census. And so she's got to go with him. Now, she's right at eight, nine months pregnant. I mean, she's right there in I don't know about you, but even on a good day, riding on a donkey, it's not a pleasant ride. You'd much rather ride a horse than a donkey, just saying. And so she's going to give birth, and there is in a barn with no doctor, no midwife, no mother, no aunts, no body to help her. Totally inadequate. In Luke chapter 1, verse 29, Confused and disturbed. Oh, yeah, you can magnify that. Confused and disturbed, anybody would be. Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. So the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for God has decided to bless and use you. You'll have a son, and you'll name him Jesus, and he will be the Son of God, and his kingdom will never end. Then Mary asked, But how can this be? Yeah, you would say that too. How, how's this going to happen? I, don't, I, I didn't make every biology class, but you know, I may have missed one, but I, I thought I'd know about this one. There you are. So she feels very inadequate. 
And how about Joseph? Fear of disapproval. Now, a lot of people live their life fear of disapproval, worry about what this one says or that one says or somebody else says or what somebody wrote on Facebook or put on the Internet on their website. I mean, Instagram, they put it on TikTok and put a story about it. See, I know a few words about that. I, I, can, I can do the Facebook. That's about it. I'm, I'm an old guy, yeah. I'm, a, I'm an experienced guy, right? Yeah. So she has to tell Joseph, hey, I'm going to have a baby. And so this is a surprise to both of them. And so how is he going to explain that to his parents and the community because everybody in town knows everybody's business in a little town, right, in Episoda? How does he explain to his business associates? You know, can you imagine the ridicule around town? Oh, yeah. If Joseph believes that, you know, he's really nuts if he buys that story. You know, he's take, she's taking him, him hook, line, sinker. She's got him. So Joseph's first reaction is what? To put her away quietly. He doesn't want to embarrass her because in that day, he could call out to the town, hey, we got a problem. She's pregnant. We haven't been together, so stone her. Could have. Or he could publicly just say, she's been a bad girl and uh, we're not getting married. But instead, he wants to just quietly, very respectfully saying, this isn't working. But he didn't. So he's praying about what he ought to do. And then something happens. Matthew 1, verse 18. Now this is how Jesus was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, being a good and righteous man, decided to break off the engagement quietly so it would not disgrace Mary publicly. But after he considered doing this, and the angel Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, you know, when the angel says Joseph, you go, what? Yeah. Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because the child in her is from God's Holy Spirit. So everything changed. See, the Lord chose the right to to watch over him. And so therefore, he was concerned about everyone, but when God spoke, it didn't matter what anybody said. Consider, the shepherds face a sudden change. Now here you got the shepherds. I mean, they're easygoing folks. They're taking their time. They're out in the field at night. You know, sheep are kind of boring. You realize that. They're just like kind of fur balls when they lay around. And they walk around. I mean, you, you got a couple of sheep dogs to help keep in line. So you don't have to go chase after them. That's sheep dogs get them back. Primarily, you just kind of watch and make sure there's no predators sneaking up. And, of course, the dogs help with that because they'll alert if they see something, and they're more alert than you are. So here they're at night. they got a campfire going. They're probably eating dinner and playing some cards, just having a good old time. And then suddenly, everything changes. Now, this is before electricity, so there's no lights. There's no lasers, nothing like that. When it's dark, it's dark other than the clouds. I mean, other than the stars in the sky and the moon. That's it. And then suddenly, there's a bright, incredible light. And there's this angel. And they, they feel like they're about ready to get killed. Well, what's going on here? Is it an alien invasion or something? We don't know what's going on. In Luke chapter 2, verse 8, that night some shepherds were in the fields outside the village guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared. And among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory flashed and surrounded them. And they were terribly frightened. Yeah, you would be too. What's going on here? So the angel said to them, don't be afraid. Is there something going on here? Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Mary, don't be afraid. Joseph, don't be afraid. Shepherds, don't be afraid. God's telling us, don't be afraid. Do everything you're supposed to do and live courageously. Now, there's another critter around. His name is Herod. 
King Herod faced the fear of losing control. Now, it'll be very important as we look at Herod as opposed to the other people. And it'll give you an idea what's going on in our world. Now, King Herod was known as the king of the Jews. He was actually truly the king of Judea, and he hated the Jews. He said, well, how could he be their king? Because the Roman emperor appointed him as the king of the Jews, and he was from Idumea. He was not a Jew. So the Jews didn't like him because he wasn't one of them, and he didn't like them because he wasn't one of them. And he was always paranoid of losing his throne. Now, it's not just in the Bible. It's well documented in history. First, he thought his brother-in-law was trying to get his throne, so he had his brother-in-law executed. Then his mother caused him some consternation, and so therefore he had his mother disposed of. And then his wife was probably complaining about him killing his own mother, and so she met her demise. And then the two sons who were supposed to be the heirs, well, let's put it this way. They said you would rather be one of Herod's pigs than one of his sons. Because, this, see, the pigs got for dinner, and, well, the sons got killed too. So here's this guy who is paranoid, and then here come some wise men from the east saying, uh, where's this newborn son who's the king of the Jews? And he goes, well, Herod goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm here. Nobody else here. He says, I'll tell you what. You go and find him and come back and tell me where he is so I can go worship him too. Right. No, he just sent a detachment of soldiers there to kill him. So what does he do? After the wise men come, he orders all male children, two years and younger, to be killed. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the time of Herod, who was the king of the Jews. Then some of the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem and started asking, Where is the child born to be king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and has come to worship him. When King Herod heard the news, he was deeply frightened and disturbed, and so was everyone else in Jerusalem. Yeah, who is he going to kill next? Now notice, Herod, the non-believer, is not told to not be afraid. Mary is told not to be afraid. Joseph's told not to be afraid. The shepherd's told not to be afraid, but not Herod. Because Herod was worried about who? Himself. And a lot of the fear and frightening going on in this world right now is people scared about themselves. Their focus is on themselves, not on God. That's why we're here today. Now, further, there's another person, Zachariah. Now, we just call him Zach but his name is Zachariah. So if you have uh, somebody named Zach in your life, his real name should be Zachariah, okay? But that's kind of hard to spell and it's rather long. You know, like Max, it's real easy. So Zach is real easy. But Zachariah faced the fear of being disappointed. Now Zachariah is kind of woven into the story multiple ways. Now Zachariah was a priest in the temple in Jerusalem, for many years, he was married to Elizabeth. They've been praying for year after year after year after year for a child to be born. No child. They finally give up praying. I mean, they got old. It's not going to happen. And they had multiple times when they thought it was going to happen, everything was prophesied, everything looked good, and then nothing happened. And then one day, he gets a visitor. Now, let me go you a few, about a year later, and then I'll get back to this. A year later, his wife is pregnant, and who shows up? Mary comes, because she's gotten out of Nazareth to be safe for a while, and she goes into their house, and when Mary enters the room, their baby inside his wife, who is John the Baptist, makes a big fuss inside. Hey, I know who that is. And he's still in his mother's womb. Now, back to where we were. So there's still, Zach Ryan, his wife, are still, Elizabeth, are still praying for a child. 
And then Luke chapter 1, verse 11 happens. While serving in the temple, notice, he's going about doing his regular things. He's not doing something outlandish or crazy or whatever. No, he's simply serving God where God has placed him. An angel appealed to Zechariah. When he saw the angel, he was confused and overwhelmed with fear. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Now, of course, the angel then tells him, Your wife is going to have a baby. And he said, I don't really believe this, whatever. And he says, Okay, you're not going to be able to speak until the child's born. And so after John the Baptist is born, they're all trying to decide, well, what should we name him? And all the relatives are going, well, let's name Zachariah or something like that. And he writes, Elizabeth says, John. They said, no, it can't be John. Let's go appeal to Zachariah. Zachariah says, writes out, John. And then he's allowed to speak again. Yeah, it's true. And so he is told what? Don't be afraid. So Mary's told don't be afraid. Joseph's told not to be afraid. The shepherds know don't be afraid. Zachariah's told not to be afraid. The only people told not, are not told that message are non-believers. And so here we live in this world right now, and there's a lot of people extremely frightened, some very good believers extremely frightened about this COVID. You know what? God knows who you are. He knows your name. He numbers the hairs on your head. And he's got to change the numbers sometimes, especially for people like me. And so God keeps up. The point is, God keeps up the most intimate detail of your life. He even knows the color of your hair, if you have some. Yes. And so if he keeps up with those details, imagine how he keeps track of whether you're going to be sick or not. And what you may be facing in life. So, yes, I say, take all proper precautions. But fear gripping you actually can open you up to sickness. It's very dangerous to be fearful. So God's word to you this Christmas is, don't be afraid. You say, okay, that's great, Pastor, but how do I do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. First, you need to surrender yourself completely over to God every day. Notice I put every day. You know, some people say, well, I surrendered my life to Christ 35 years ago. Well, that's great. Well, what about today? Well, I, I did it 35 years ago. Yeah, but what about today? Because what? The Christian life is the daily walk. And it's a daily walk for a reason to help us remember every day I need to reconnect with God. I need to keep in the focus and the future of my life every day. So who do we have this? We have Mary. She's overcome with her inadequacy. The angel has unloaded her all kind of stuff on her. She goes, man, I don't know if I can take all this. You know, you're going to have a child. You haven't been with a man. You're going to, he's the son of God. He's the Messiah. Uh, okay, how do you raise a Messiah? You know, it, it's, how are you supposed to raise him? He's different than any child ever. And there she's just this little peasant girl, no education, no wealth, backs out of nowhere. So what does she do? Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant, and I'm willing to accept whatever God wants for my life perfect answer. And that's the perfect answer for us every day because God will cause us to be challenged on things. We go, well, I don't know if I want to do that. When God calls you to do something, just jump right in. It's the only safe place to be. You can tell her perspective is God's my creator. I know he wants me to have a full and joyful life. So what he wants me to do is what's the most joyful and happiness for my life. So I'm his servant. So whatever it takes, I'm going to do that. Have you ever had God challenge you to do something and you go, eh, I'm going to do it? Mm -hmm. You know what? 
from that point on, you and God have had a tension. Yeah. Until you settle that issue. In Job eleven thirteen, surrender your heart to God, turn to Him in prayer, and give up your sins. Then you won't be ashamed, you will be confident and fearless. And I'm going to talk more about why you'll be confident and fearless. Just, uh, just know this. When you are with God daily, you are confident and fearless because who's with you? Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge, and your darkness nights will be brighter than noon. Then you'll rest safe and secure, filled with hope and emptied of worry. So worry goes away when you put God first. So give, surrender your my life completely to God every day. Number two, stop listening to the voices of fear. Oh, they're legion this time, aren't they? The voices of fear are all around. So, you know, what do you got to do? You got to change some things that you watch, some things you listen to, some people you hang around even. Do you realize... We live in a very negative culture, don't we? You know, if you try to be, it's a lot easier in our culture to be negative than positive. It's a lot easier to tear somebody down than to build something up. The negative voices say, well, you just can't do it. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not nice enough. You're not good looking enough. You're not educated enough. The negative voices are legion. Just know that. And there's another voice you got to stop listening to, yourself. Yeah. Too many times we tear down ourselves. No. Stop believing everything you tell yourself. Because a lot of times we lie to ourselves, you realize that. Consider, Romans 14, 23. Whatever is not based on faith is sin. So when you take action to do, you have to be doing it according to your faith. Not because, well, I think this is the right way, or, well, everybody else is doing it. Well, I don't want to go against the grain. No. What does God want you to do? Now, sometimes, yeah, he wants you to go with the flow, but more than likely than not, he wants you to go the other way. You go, why do I want to go the other way? Because it's where God wants me to go. I've done, I've been a pastor since 1982. That's a long time. So I've counseled a lot of people on various things, finances, career, marriage, all kind of stuff. One thing I have found that's consistent, fear is highly contagious. When somebody is fearful in a relationship, whatever it may be, it's really contagious and can cause tremendous problems. You know what? If you hang around with depressed people, you get depressed. If you hang around with angry people, you get angry. If you got, get all, hang around with people that are all spazzed out politically, that's how it's going to be. If you want to soar with the eagles, you can't run around with the turkeys. Now, that's an old cliche, but it's true. You got to say, you know what? I'm going to take the road with Jesus. Because there's no political party that's always for God. You realize that. Right. They all use believers for what they want. And many times we get, we get sometimes if it's right, we get some things that help us, but ne the government is never all for us. No. Never. Three, fill your mind with music that praises God. Hmm. Now, you need other people singing than me, but I'll tell you about it, okay? I want you to listen closely. Praise is the antidote to panic. Worship is the antidote to worry. So you don't go, I don't want to worry, I don't want to worry, I don't want to worry. No. Praise God. Worship God. What happens? You take your mind, your focus off your problem, and you put it on God, who's the solution of all of our problems. 
Why? Because you lose your fear when God is near. The farther the less you think about God, the farther you get away from him. No, put your focus on him. That's why singing is so important. Now, I enjoy making a joyful noise. I sing. You don't want to hear it. But I sing. That's why I'm over here in a corner by myself when y'all are singing. In Luke chapter 1, verse 46. Then Mary sang, With all my heart I praise the Lord. I rejoice in the God my Savior. For he notices and cares for me, a simple servant girl. He has blessed me and his mighty one who is holy. He is all-powerful. He can do anything. He meets our needs, and he keeps his promises. And notice, Mary sang, Elizabeth sang, the angels sang, the shepherds sang, Zachariah sang. Realize the only one that didn't sing? The non-believer Herod. All the believers sang. All the believers praised God. Fourth, base my hope on the promises of God. Base my hope for my life on the promises of God. Let me ask you a personal question. What have you put your hope in for this next year, 2021? You have it in the economy, in yourself, in, in a politician, in political correctness or conventional wisdom, public or cultural values. Now, I put my hope right here in, the, in God's Word because He's given us over 7,000 promises. So, what if you had a medical emergency? And they say, you got to have an operation, okay? Where's the first thing you do? Is it covered in my insurance policy? <laughs> oh, it's covered. Okay, I go back to the doctor. Okay, I can have this procedure, as they want to call it. We call it surgery. They want it to be a procedure. You know, they're, you know, I love physicians, but they're always practicing, you know. You know, in any other profession, if you made, made a mistake, well, you'd have to do it again for free. If, if the physician makes a mistake, you now he charges you a second time. Yeah. There's an interesting one on that, but I won't go there today. It'd be funny, but that's okay. <laughs> well, let me just say, our friend Jay Barnwell, they had to put a screw in his back to fix something, but the screw they put in was too long, and it aggravated his nerve. Yeah. And so then his foot felt hot all the time. So they had to go in and remove the longer screw and put in a shorter one. And, of course, they charged him for the second procedure. Just know that. You know, if I did that, you know, I have to do it again for free. But, you know, that's whatever. That's just in interesting. <laughs> kind of laugh at Jay for a while. But anyway, back to our story. So you don't worry about the procedure because you have your insurance. Now, in life, you're going to have problems. And so... In the Bible, we find wisdom about finances, relationships, health, career, your past, your present, your future, and your eternity. And it's all right here. And so this is over 7,000 promises in here of God's promises to you. Now, here's the problem. Many people get gifts, but they don't unwrap them. You realize that. You ever had a Christmas gift under your tree and it stayed there because they didn't come get it? Well, a lot of people have a Christmas gift under their tree because it's Christmas season and it's the Word of the Bible and God's got more than 7,000 promises for them, but they go, well, I don't need that. They're missing out. It's kind of like somebody wrote you a check for a billion dollars and you go, well, that's just a piece of paper and they never cash the check. That's how many people have with God's Word. It's 7,000 promises, and I'm not going to go over them all today because I did that the last several weeks, covered a few of them because there's so many of them, you just can cover a few at a time. 
Consider Luke chapter 1, verse 45. Elizabeth said to Mary, You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. You say, well, when does this happen? Mary shows up, and Elizabeth is pregnant too, and John the Baptist, who's in her womb, leaps with joy when Mary comes into the room. And Elizabeth knows that's the promised Messiah in you, Mary. You know, I want you to be blessed tremendously. You know, for many years I served many churches, quote, at full-time salary. Since I've been here, I only have received a house allowance, and that only a short time. I've never accepted a salary from this church. Why? I'm here because I love you, and I serve you because God has called me here. In Psalms 53, verse 3. When I was afraid, I put my trust in God. And when I trusted in God, I was not afraid. I praise him for what he has promised. See, God has promised I'll meet all of your needs. And God has met all of my needs. And then some way, I must admit, God's blessed me in ways I've never dreamed I'd ever be blessed. And you guys are a large part of that because you love God so much. But the greatest promise we have is here. Now, I'm not going to try to cover 7,000 of them, but let me give you John 3.16. I want to just give you one. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Now, what a promise. You know, that's not only for now, your sins will be forgiven. That's, you know, you realize you have B.C. before Christ and A.D., which means the Lord. Our history is split by his coming. So when you look on your calendars, you're reminded how far back it was there. I got a Christmas gift this year that said how many miles it was to Golgotha, to the cross. That's a long way from Navasota. I wouldn't want to take that walk. I think it's over 7,000 miles. And you, and you have to swim in between. I mean, that's a long swim. But it reminds us every day that something significant happened there. But we couldn't have gotten Golgotha until you had Christmas. Until the Savior came, we had nothing. And now we have everything. Now, I want you to know something. Uh, I've studied this extensively. It was really hard to figure out. But I've come up with the mortality rate of the human race is 100%. Yeah. We're all going to die. Well, we don't expect to die now. Okay, we always think, well, that's a long way off. You know, I'm not even thinking about it. Yeah, but you know what? We need to be ready for it. Because it's going to happen one day. You know, somebody says, well, I, I, I don't even want to think about it. Well, you're just in denial. Yeah, you're going to die one day. And it, sometimes it comes unexpected. Sometimes you're sick a long time, and it happens. My sister's father-in-law was uh, sick a long time, and then he had to put him on hospital care. And then he passed away this past week, and I, I was asked uh, to officiate his funeral but I was asked before he passed away, I said, well, I need to meet the guy. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to do a funeral if you've already met him. So I went and met with him, and we talked, and uh, I was very pleased we could talk and so forth. But he was ready. He made his peace with God some time ago, and he was ready. The whole purpose of Christmas is that we'll have hope. Don't be afraid. The Messiah has come. And if you receive Jesus as your Savior, you have eternal life and your sins forgiven. Consider Hebrews 12, 15. Jesus came to die for us so that we could free us from living our lives as slaves to the fear of death. Let me say that again. Jesus came to die for us so he could free us 
from living our lives as slaves to the fear of death. So God doesn't want us walking around in fear. Draw close to God, know His promise, then live triumphantly. Does living triumphantly mean you don't take precautions? No, take all appropriate precautions you feel you need to make. But don't walk around in fear. Don't be chicken little running around, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. We're going to get through this together. But remember his promises. Be close to God every day. Every day. No fear. Don't fear. Trust God with all of your heart. With all of your heart. When we celebrate Christmas, we're focusing this time of the year on his coming. His plans for us, the opportunities we have, and the victorious life he wants us to live. Seize it with all of you, God. So I want to pray a prayer, a no fear prayer. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come to you today surrendering our lives completely to you. Your God, we're not. I want you to transform our lives. You want us to be happy and joyful more than anyone else. Help us stop listening to the voices of fear and help us to hang out with people with great faith. Help us fill our minds with the music that praises you and base our hope not on flimsy ideas but the solid promises of your word. Lord, you've, we believe that you have sent your son to die for us. And you rose again to know we have no fear of death, no fear of tomorrow. Because you live, we can face tomorrow. So right now I want to ask you to accept me into your family. I ask you to repent of our sins. And we accept you as our Lord and Savior. Help us, Lord, to understand it more every day, what it means to open up our life to you. Help us to live with purpose for you, honoring you with your life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us stand today for the invitation as we draw close to the Lord today.